Hello, my name is Kishwani. That's K E S H W A N I. Kishwani. We are here because we want to prepare for GMAT. We have been solving GMAT math problems out of this book here, the GMAT official guide 2024. If you do not own this book already, purchase one immediately. You're going to need it. Always make sure this book is in front of you when you're working with me. Well, today we'll do problems that you will find on page number 78 and today is our day number 4. The very first problem as you can see is already on the blackboard. I'm going to read the problem to you and then I'm going to get out of the frame. I want you to pause the video, do the problem yourself and then we'll do it together. Here's the question. The question says that we have 24 cards and the cards are numbered 1 through 24. In other words, each card has a unique number. We're going to draw one card at random. The question simply is what are the odds that the number that we're going to draw will be divisible by both 2 and 3 or is divisible by 7. Go ahead, do it yourself. The trick here is that don't try to find numbers that are divisible by 2 and the numbers that are divisible by 3 and then the, then the numbers that are divisible by 7. That becomes too tedious, too annoying. What we need to understand here is that if a given number is divisible by 2 and 3, if a number is divisible by 2 and 3, any number, then that number by definition must also be divisible by 6. That's what we're looking for. Numbers that are divisible by 6 and or the numbers that are divisible by 7. And that's all there is. Let's see what we can do. 1 through 24. So very first one is going to be 6. 6 is divisible by both 2 and 3. 7 happens to be divisible by 7 because I checked on my calculator. The next one in line is going to be 6 times 2 which is 12. The one after that is going to be 14 which is this guy. It's divisible by 7. The one after that is going to be 18. I'm running out of room here. 18. And then we have 20, 21, 7, 14, 21 and finally 24. They're sold. How many are there? So these are, these are the numbers that are divisible by 6 and the, these are the ones that are divisible by 7. And if, the, if these are divisible by 6, they must be divisible by both 2 and 3. It's not, it doesn't say 2 or 3, it says 2 and 3. This is the end part. A bit too late in the story for me to write it out, but that's what it was. That's all. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. 7 out of 24. The odds of picking such a number are 7 out of 24. There are 24 se there are 7 such cards in the stack of 24 num 24 cards which will fulfill the requirement. Requirement being that it is going to be divisible by part 2 and 3 or it's going to be divisible by 7. This was the old part. Number 25. In 25 we have two choices we are told. We have two choices. I don't want to erase my zero. Don't worry what that is. It doesn't concern us. Here we are told that we have two choices. We are about to start a new job, a sales position, and our boss, our potential new boss, gives us two choices. One choice is that we can take a straight $35,000 in salary and make a zero commission. Commission has two M's and two S's. Or we can draw a salary of ten thousand dollars and make twenty percent in commission, twenty percent of everything that we sell. Question simply is What is the break-even point? What is the break-even point? Even though they do not call it break-even point, let's see what they call it. What must be the what must be the total annual sales to be to give her the same annual pay in either choices? What's the break-even point? Do it yourself.
we need room so we can start from the top let's do it on the top so the first choice is that we can take a straight salary of 35,000 and that amount in order for it to be break even point has to equal the $10,000 salary that we're going to draw plus 20% of the commission on the sales there you go X represents the sales. We just have to find out what X is. Let's subtract 10 from both sides. So 0 0.2, 0 0.2 X will equal 25, which implies that 2 X will equal 250, which implies in turn that X must be half of that, $125,000. $125,000. In other words, if this young lady who is about to start a new job, if this young lady feels that she can make the sales per year of more than $125,000, then she should not accept the flat salary. She should go for the option with the commission. She will make more money. Number 26. Maybe she is selling cars. And if each car is being sold for $25,000, then if she feels that she can sell more than five cars in a year, go for the commission. Number 26. We are told that if one is less than X, and X is less than Y, and Y is less than Z, then the question is which must be greatest. And here are the five choices. First choice is Z plus X plus 1. Let's do three at a, two or three at a time. The next one is Z times Y plus 1. And let's do one more if you like. Since I don't have the room, let's just do two first. So how should we do about it? Again, you have the options. You can do it algebraically if you wish. I don't want to do that. It's too tedious, it's too ugly, it's too, too time consuming. Or you can simply plug in the numbers. I want you to pause the video right now, plug in some numbers, plug in some nice numbers. One is less than x, x is less than so on and so forth. Why don't we plug in two, three and four and figure out which one is bigger between the two. Z is four, x plus one is going to be three, and z is four, and y plus one is going to be four. As you can see, this quantity is already more than this one, so the answer is not A. We have knocked out A. Let's look at C. Answer is not A. C says X times Y plus Z. X is 2, and Y plus Z is going to give us 4 plus 5. That's going to give us 7. There you go. That's 14. This is 16. Oh, that's 16. That's 16, that's 14, that means this is not the answer. The answer is not C, which means this guy is still a contender. B is still a contender. Let's look at D. D says Y times X plus Z. Y is 3, and X plus Z is going to give us 2 plus 4, that's 6, that's 18. That was 16, that guy is gone. So far, so far the contest has been D and the last answer choice E. Let's look at E. Let's look at E right here. E says Z times X plus Y. Z is 4 and X plus Y is going to give us 5. There you go. 5 times 4 is 20 and this was only 18. The answer is not D. The correct answer is E. And that's all it is. Don't make it complicated. Don't make, it, uh, don't make it ugly by trying to solve it algebraically. It can be done alg algebraically, obviously, which is what they show you in the book, in the, answer, in the answer explanation, but don't go that route. Just plug in numbers. Number 27. Number 27 says we have set X which is made up of 8 consecutive 
integers. And then we have set y, and we are told that set y is going to be derived from set x. It's going to be derived from set x by adding add 4 to all. And and subtract 4 from all. The question simply is after we finish doing this thing, how many elements how many how many more elements, how many more members does set Y have? Do it yourself. Again, the simplest, quickest way to do is to just make up the eight numbers. It may seem like you're taking a long time to write eight numbers, but trust me, it's faster than trying to think logically and trying to solve it algebraically. Just make up eight numbers and see what happens. We'll see what happens. So here are the eight numbers. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. We'll just see what happens. Then we're going to add, so this is our set X. Then we're going to add 4 to each number. As you start, start adding 4 to it, 1 is going to become 5. I'm going to write that here. 2 plus 4 is 6. 7, 8. We are up to here 4. 4 5 plus 4 is 9, 10, 11, and 12. So that takes care of that part. Now we're going to subtract 4 from each side. And when you want to subtract 4 from each side, so start from this end. 4, 8 minus 4 is going to give us 4, 3, 2, 1. We are up to here, 5 minus 4 is 1, then 4 minus 4 is going to give us 0, a negative 1, a negative 2, and a negative 3. All you have to do at this point is to find out how many more set Y has, which is very straightforward. But this is, this is the same. These elements overlap. We have 4 on this side, negative 3, negative 2, negative 1, 0, and we have 4 on this side. The answer is 8. Set Y has 8 more members compared to set X. Number 28. Let me write it here. As you can see again, there's a lot of fuss in these questions for nothing at all. It's a very simple, very childish problem. The question simply is, what's the closest amount to this quantity here? In other words, we're looking for approximate value. This quantity is approximately equal to 60. This is just 1. That's a 5. It's 12. It's a bloody 12. This quantity is approximately 12. Number 29. But as you can see, not all questions are going to be gifts. Some are tricky. Some require thinking. Such as the one that we are about to do. Pay attention. Here we are told that we own exactly 140 books. We are told that each book is either paperback fiction or paperback non-fiction or hardcover hardcover non-fiction so one more time the, the notation that I'm using is that paperback fiction I'm going to call it PF paperback fiction paperback non-fiction Hardcover non-fiction. Hardcover non-fiction. These are the three types of books we have. We are told that we have a total of 140 books. We are further told that we have 20 
Timothy Moore, paperback nonfiction, then hardcover nonfiction. You see hardcover nonfiction, paperback nonfiction right here. This is what we're talking about. We have 20 more paperback nonfiction compared to hardcover nonfiction. And twice as many paperback fiction as paperback nonfiction. Are you with me? The question simply is how many hardcover nonfiction do we have? This is the guy we are interested in. How many do we have? One more time. I'm going to read the problem one more time. Then I'm going to get out of the frame. And this one I do insist that you pause it and do it yourself. So here we go. We are told that we own exactly 140 books. We are told that each book falls in one of these three categories. It's either a paperback fiction or a paperback non-fiction or a hardcover non-fiction. We have to meet two conditions. One condition is that we are told that we have 20 more paperback non-fiction than a hardcover non-fiction. And we have twice as many paperback fiction compared to paperback hardcover. The question simply is how many hardcover non-fiction do we have? Do it yourself. So here we go. So there are two ways we can set up this problem. Listen carefully. There are two ways we can set up this problem. There are two ways we can look at the world. We can look at the world in terms of paperback books and hardcover books. Or we can look at the world in terms of fiction books, fiction books that deal with work of fictions, or the books that deal with non-fiction. Those are the two choices. Fiction versus non-fiction, or paperback versus hardcover. If you keep it simple like that, it's very straightforward. So here we go. I'm going to set it up both ways. Let's begin. So we have 140 books. Let's look at paperback and hardcovers. Okay? And in paperback, of course, we have fiction and non-fiction. In hardcover, we have fiction and non-fiction. Let's, let's see what we have. I have erased everything, but of course you have it in front of you. I hope you wrote it down. So we were told that we own 20 more, we own 20 more paperback non-fiction, paperback non-fiction. We own 20 more of these books compared to hardcover non-fiction. Hardcover non-fiction. Let's call this X. If we have X here, this must be X plus 20. So that's the first condition. We are also told that we have twice as many paperback fiction. Paperback fiction, we have twice as many paperback fiction compared to paperback non-fictions. Since we have twice as many paperback fiction compared to paperback non-fiction, this quantity will have to be two times this amount. You with me so far? And what about hardcover non-fiction? Hardcover fiction. Well, no mention was made of hardcover fiction. It's zero. Apparently, this guy has no hardcover books which deals with the work of fiction. All of his hardcover books deal with non -fiction. All of his hardcover books deal with non-fiction. Very good, that's our equation. That's what it is. And this has to add up, all of these quantities have to add up to 140. And that's all there is. And once we finish solving it, the way we set it up cleverly is that once we finish solving it, this is exactly what we're looking for. The question was, how many hardcover non-fiction do we have? That's our x. So let's begin, shall we? Pay attention, let's make sure we don't make any mistakes. So here we have 2x. Here's another x, that's 3, that's 4. So there's 4x, and let's hope I didn't make a mistake. And then we have 2 times 20 is 40, there's 60 equals 140. Take away 60 from both sides, there's 80. 4x equals 80, there you go. x must be 20. Very good, done. We have 20. x is equal to 20. We have 20 hardcover nonfiction. We could have set it up a different way. We could have set it up instead of looking at the world in terms of paperback and hardcover I'm going to give you a second first so you can actually have an unobstructed view here let's set it up the other way around I'm going to erase all of this now 
140 books. And instead of looking at the world, instead of looking at the world in terms of paperback and hardcover, why don't we look at the world in terms of fiction and non-fiction? Again, fictions, it could be either hardcover or paperback, paperback or hardcover, paperback or hardcover. Let's see what we can do now. We are told that we own 20 more paperback non-fiction. Where is paperback non-fiction? There you go. Non-fiction paperback. We have 20 more of these books compared to hardcover non-fiction. Hardcover, right here. Hardcover, hardcover non-fiction. We have 20 more of these compared to this guy. So if this is X, this has to be X plus 20. With me so far? We are further told that we own twice as many paperback fiction. Paperback fiction. We own twice as many paperback fiction as paperback non-fiction. So this quantity has to be twice that quantity. And we have no hardcover fiction. There you go, as you can see, it's the exact same equation. Of course it's the bloody exact same equation, otherwise we'll have a problem. That was number 29. Let's look at number 30. Number 30, the very last problem on the page. Average of four numbers, these four numbers, 3, 15, 32, and n plus 1 is 18, is 18. The question simply is, what must be, what must be the value of n for that to be true? For, for the average of these four quantities to be 18, what must be n? Again, you have two choices as always. You can take this exam. GMAT is a standardized exam, just like any standardized exam. All the standardized exam that I teach, all of the standardized exams, as you can see, they are GRE, GMAT, SAT, SAT, TES, all of these things that you see there, except of course these two, these two deal with languages. But all the others, all the standardized exams, I forget now what I was going to say, all the standardized exams, when you're dealing with math problems, you have two essential choices to solve the problem in a classical way, the orthodox way, the geeky way, the nerdy way, the mathematical way, the way that will please your math teacher, or you can do it a quick and dirty way. The way that will please your math teacher here would be to set it up in a very classical way, like this. Divided by 4, and set it up to 18 because that's the average and solve for n. If you want to go that route, be my guest. That's not what I'm going to do. I don't like it. 3, 15, 32, and n plus 1. Watch what happens. n plus 1. Since the average is 18, since the average is 18, I'm going to force these numbers to become 18. I'm going to force each of these numbers to become 18. Here we have only 3. Here we have 15. In order to convert this into 18, we need 3. And if you're going to add, if you're going to give this guy $3, we have to take the $3 from this guy. So now this becomes 18 and this becomes 29. Are you with me so far? This guy, is, this guy stays 3. This guy is still 3. We don't want 3, we want 18. We need to give this guy 15 more dollars. Now this is 18, this guy is 18, and since we gave this guy $15, we have to take away $15 from this guy. And that becomes 14. Are you with me so far? That's all, we're done. We're almost done. So this guy has $18, this guy has $18, but this guy only has $14. This guy has only $14, which means we have a deficit of $4. This deficit of $4 has to be made up by the last guy. This deficit of four dollars has to be made up by last guy. In other words, the last guy does not have, does not only need to have enough money for himself, which is eighteen dollars, but he has to have four extra dollars to give it to this guy. In other words, n plus one needs to be twenty-two. N is twenty-one. I'll see you tomorrow. Okay. Bye now.